how can you turn something like this, mass of weeds, random plants, into something like that? Incredible abundance. I had the beautiful opportunity to buy this piece of land, 0.9 acres, 3,600 square meters. Early 2021 is when I actually finally got in here. So that's less than four years ago. And actually I remember making a hole in the hedge that was there and stepping through in January 2021 and looking at it and it was like massive weeds such as we see still in the far corner here and feeling completely daunted. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? And how much time have I got available to take on a new project like this? And yet, yeah, bit by bit, using no dig methods, which are so beautiful for how you can do it incrementally. You haven't got to sort of take in a big area all at once. You can just make a bed, then make another bed. And that's kind of what I've done here. It's, but I started with a bit more than one bed. I've got help. This is a working market garden. We're, we're selling quite a lot of vegetables. And so we, we've expanded the area. And starting with 300 square meters, the bit behind me, that was the first block in year one, 2021. And then adding bits incrementally, 2022 to 23, 24. So here I'm showing you ways of doing that and doing it in a way that gives you fantastic, healthy, fertile soil, which is time efficient to maintain. So starting out with no dig, there are two ways you can do it. You can put cardboard on the weeds. That's like we did here. This whole area, we didn't use any plastic. We put cardboard on the weeds, compost on top of the cardboard, and then you can sow and plant straight away. And in fact, that's what I did with the asparagus here because I wanted to get it in the ground. I got these crowns April 2021 and it is only a month since the, the ground had been covered with anything. And so there was still an incredible amount of roots of perennial weeds like bindweed, cooch grass, particularly uh, some thistles, dandelions. And you can see all that in the video that we filmed actually in that month. And Edward got nice shots of planting crowns into just massive weeds. And we kept on top of it after that by repeated use of the trowel to keep removing the regrowth. And it's worked, is all I can say. Two, two years later, this area of asparagus, this whole bed, and it, was, it wasn't fully planted that year. Uh, we've planted some since, but there's no more bindweed. There was no more bindweed by the end of the second summer. So for me, that's, that's the, the principle of one way of dealing with difficult weeds, starting out without any plastic or anything like that. But it does involve a lot of repeat follow-up work. No dig doesn't mean no weeding, but it means in particular, you can really get on top of the perennial weeds in the first year or two. Bindweed, maybe two years. Dandelions, cooch grass, one year. But you've also got to do the pathways. And if you don't keep your pathways weed free, the weeds are just going to spread in. You can see that links into the whole way of setting up here with no sides to beds, it's open. And plants can then root into the pathways. Pathways are part of the soil. So you get a better overall growth. It's looking pretty lush because like this beetroot bed here has had no rain, sorry, very little rain and no water on it. And the other part about no dig, but you could say about any gardening actually, starting from scratch, is lifting the fertility of the soil. And I'm using compost, which is actually anything decomposed. It doesn't have to be perfect looking compost. It could be quite lumpy, old animal manure, for example. It's organic matter to enrich the soil fertility in the long term. So we put on quite a bit at the beginning. That does involve either making a lot or more likely <laughs> see if you could buy some. And I experimented with a different way of doing it using wood chip. I thought, you know, maybe that one could use a good dose up to 10 centimeter, four inches of wood chip. And I got some delivered. The, the tree surgeon said, yeah, it's old wood chip, two years old. Uh, I didn't really look at something. It's quite big pieces as well of hardwood. That was not ideal. We put that straight on the weeds, black plastic over the top and actually left it for a whole year. And I thought, well, that will surely kill most of the weeds. It didn't kill the bindweed, so we still had some follow-up on bindweed. We took the plastic off in the second year and actually planted potatoes and rhubarb. Uh, the rhubarb has grown okay, but the, maybe the roots go down right below. The potatoes did not grow well. It was a bit of a disaster, actually. So I'm not a great fan of using wood chip instead of compost, but a little bit on the pathways is great. Uh, but compost, you know, imperfect, however it might be, is what you want on your beds. So there is a second option for starting out where it's quicker because putting down a, a large area of cardboard involves many pieces overlapping if you haven't got big pieces of cardboard. And using black plastic like I'm showing you here, 
is a very quick way to convert incredible uh, strong weed <laughs> into clean soil because it can be very daunting and you know I know this feeling all my life you know how do you how do you do it how do you start out and here we did a very simple thing we spread around seven centimeters just about three inches of compost I bought some green waste compost some mushroom compost spread it on the weeds no cardboard and then a sheet of black plastic on top Okay, I know that not everybody likes plastic and it has bad connotations, but actually this is reused. It's, this is the sixth time it's been used for a mulching job like this. This very same sheet was mulching weeds around the pond last winter and it was on the area we just walked past last summer and the previous area <laughs> I had a shot the summer before. So it, I just keep using this. It's about 60 square meters of uh, ground that you, I can cover with this sheet of plastic. Uh, it's just really simple and rapid and then we plant through it so it's still there and if you've got really vigorous weeds like bindweed, uh, cooch grass that, that would keep growing you'd have to keep going back with a trowel to keep on top of them. Uh, it's very simple here because you just need to remove the, those weeds from the planting holes but they can come up through the planting holes. And in this summer where it's been pretty cool here we haven't had any massive heat wave or anything. It's, actually in the end it's quite normal temperature. I had a really cold start though in June uh, almost a frost and these plants really struggle but the black plastic helps because the sun on it warms the ground it keeps in that warmth at the beginning and for the summer we've had I'm really really pleased actually really impressed with the growth here there's cranberry squash which I think are going to come for harvest in September and the, the curry squash before that and when they finish so we harvest the squash maybe by early October even and then remove all the plant growth on top which won't be much by then the leaves naturally die off and then we roll up the plastic job done and we make beds uh, that's up to you how you do that maybe put a bit of extra compost on or you can scoop out the compost in pathways to put it on the beds and then put some wood chip in the pathway there's no wood chip here yet and there you are you, you, you controlled a lot of the difficult weeds from the beginning with not much time and effort needed one purchase that's look on that as long-term investment of the compost and you get a harvest while the weeds are dying and then you're set up good to go in the following years Fertility is key to growing great vegetables and flowers and doing it in a time efficient way and having a wonderful abundance and spending less time weeding. So how do you achieve that from the beginning? Uh, here I was experimenting with using a bit less compost at the beginning, say around seven centimeters, three inches. And in the rest of my garden, I'd been starting out with a bigger dose than that, maybe 10 to 15 centimeter, four to six inches. And that has been very successful and it seems a lot at the beginning but it's very much setting up for ongoing abundance in an easy way and so yeah look on it as an investment that's how i see it now and you know uh, be prepared to really pile it on at the beginning but it means also you can crop a smaller area so you know you don't need so much compost in the end and no dig is very conserving of soil carbon i've just had a test on my dig no dig trial beds and in the dig bed we I dig once here, 14% carbon. In the no dig bed, for the same amount of compost, 18% carbon. So that's showing how efficient it is as a way of using compost. And ongoing, we are using here around just over an inch, about three centimeters once a year. That's all put it on in the autumn. And it's you're ready for the spring. Don't get so many slugs doing it that way. And then uh, it's wood chip on the pathway. Again, not too much. They don't, don't use loads of wood chip. You don't need a lot. Uh, less than an inch about two centimeters it, it's not smothering weeds you do that in the beginning so that's the beginning phase i've been explaining to you cardboard or compost or compost with plastic on top to get rid of that initial existing weeds once you've done that it, ongoing it's about hand weeding the weeds that come up through the compost all the wood chip in the pathway and maintaining f fertility at a good level and just one more thing is that if your soil is uh, poor infertile like chalk sand uh, you will need to use more compost than I've described because it's important to remember that vegetables are not kind of natural plants. They're highly bred and they don't grow wild in nature. You don't just find loads of beetroot growing out there. Well, you might find some wild beetroot, but the abundance that we're looking for. So that's where the, the compost really makes such a huge difference. So why am I saying that you have fewer weeds when you've got more fertility? It's two things. One is you're not disturbing soil that's part of the no dig things that would be bringing fresh weed seeds up to the surface but it's also more than that which is that weeds are a repair mechanism for soil that's damaged disturbed or feeling in need of replenishment 
Uh, we have a saying in the farming world here that chickweed follows the rotavator and massively disturbs all weeds, bind it together again and restore the structure and by covering it and then they drop seeds of course and then you're in a difficult position. So Nudig with the compass on top, you're, you're kind of keeping soil calm, you're not disturbing anything, you're not trying to dig out those bindweed roots at the beginning, just leave them there. But you keep removing the regrowth and then they eventually die. So you end up, even though you might have to do some removal of perennial weeds in year one, you end up with a pretty weed-free surface. We spend here almost zero time weeding in the middle of this patch. I mean that, really almost zero. You know, a few minutes a week kind of thing and just while we're doing other jobs. It's more edging is the job just to stop the grass and weeds invading. So it's been an interesting summer weather-wise for growing vegetables, quite challenging, but some notable successes actually have been perennial vegetables from seed. And these are artichokes, which I sowed in February, transplanted here in April, cropped quite abundantly through July and early August. Behind me there is some asparagus from seed. We haven't actually cropped that yet, but it's only in its third summer. So it was sown and planted in 2022 and we'll start cropping in spring 25. And also from seed, I've sowed some rhubarb about five weeks ago and the plants are now ready in the greenhouse and we're making a new little bed here. Put some, that's homemade compost on top of the um, soil which was already mulched previous, from previously. And the rhubarb there is looking a bit meager at the moment because with all the rain we've had, particularly the, in the late spring, uh, got quite a lot of this disease uh, a culture and the yellowing of the leaves and I actually tidied them all up about three days ago and put them on the compost here. I'm totally happy to compost all diseases and weeds. So this is ongoing a bit of a perennial corner and trying a few new things. Considering this year's average temperatures, no great heat, I'm impressed with the growth we've had in here. It's really fascinating how the tomatoes are now doing it. They really didn't look like they were going to and they are a bit late but we have picked quite a few already the beefsteak tomatoes. But one thing I'm really noticing this year is the extra length we seem to have on, on plant stems. And so I've been dropping the tomatoes down much more than normal. And so you can see from the lying stems on the ground how you know they, they would have been like twice as tall as me if I hadn't done that. And we'd have run out of space. So that is a way of coping with it when it happens. And now I've actually taken out the tops of the tomatoes. Usually do that around the middle of August because We've only got about two months less than actually of potential time for new fruits to form and then have time to ripen. But generally this is just beautiful no dig. We put on a compost mulch once a year in May actually before planting the summer plantings. It just works best into the timing because we're going to grow winter salad in here as well uh, without putting on any more compost in the autumn. And I'm not feeding those tomatoes or anything in there. It's just the relying on the compost. It's, it's so efficient. You know, it saves time. You're not having to worry about liquid feeds or fertilizer or anything like that. And you just get this incredibly fast growth. It's, uh, in the summer, particularly. Uh, I'm not saying this is peculiar to nothing, but I certainly find it here quite amazing. So these cabbage, for example, they went in the ground on the 18th of July. I mean, look at this. That, that's just one month ago and they're a savoy cabbage for the winter they followed lettuce so this most of what you're seeing here is a succession planting of you know the set that something has already cropped basically and we have fantastic crop of lettuce in this bed didn't put any more compost on and planted these savoy cabbage and they will crop i hope in the winter but just enjoying this really rapid growth and the other thing here is that we is that's the first time i've taken this cover off since so these went in and they haven't been weeded and you can see there's not too many weeds. So key to great gardening is converting all your waste materials and maybe lots of others beside that you can scrounge from elsewhere into something super valuable, which is compost. And the compost you make, it's not going to be perfect looking, but it will be super powerful in terms of microbes and quality. Uh, this is different ways of doing it with the same principle of roughly one quarter brown materials, three quarters green. Uh, we just load in the materials as we have them. And this is a compost bay that you can buy. It's from the, my, the Crocus page I have on the Crocus website of my recommended products. And it's just bits of wood that's slapped together like that. And what you could do is buy three of these and make two heaps out of it and they'd be slightly higher, for example. And we're going to turn this. Uh, I've got to work out <laughs> to make another little frame to put it in. And here is the, the ones that I normally use 
or among many others actually of just four pallet frames with two bits of wire on each corner and I just keep loading up loading up and we line them with cardboard that's that's the really important bit I find that makes a huge difference is keeping the heat and moisture in makes such a big difference and we get a really nice compost one turn will improve it even more but you don't have to turn it and you can use it for within six to ten months roughly buying this land has given me the possibility of space to do other things and it's been a very evolving affair because I'm not a great person for sitting down with a piece of paper and, and making a great plan and having in my head clearly what I want going forwards. I don't really, I don't really work like that because what I love is to let, let a project, this project say evolve and then you meet people and then they have an idea or, or the possibility arises to do something maybe you, you think oh god it'd be really great to uh, try this or that and so uh, that shed was one of the first things that went up and I actually you know more on a whim than anything I made it much bigger than I thought we might really need and boy every every bit of space there is is being used at different times of the year it's relatively empty at the moment well not empty but it's we're waiting we'll be putting a lot of vegetables in there to store over winter and the table you know it's storage space for furniture as well and all sorts of things like that all the covers are in there hanging up so it's great to have space for storage i didn't really have that before at homemakers and the crops area here i mean and I'm, am i going to expand that oh maybe not actually because it, it's so good to have more area for other things like the two ponds now and the first pond, okay, it didn't really work. <laughs> so this clay here is not quite impermeable enough, but it's now a fantastic wet dry feature and we've got lovely wildflowers around it. So it's, it's nice actually, I really like it. And then we have got the smaller pond with a liner. So that's a different way of doing it. And, and that's permanent pond. <laughs> uh, fun to have that, different wildlife. There's three different types of newt there, for example. And then um, I had bees, so that, that didn't work out and I think it's because the energy here is so strong it's like I was talking to a beekeeper about it yesterday and we're counting how we, we had in the second spring we had five swarms from three hives in about six weeks so that one two of the hives swarmed and then swarmed again and we weren't on it enough it, it was bad beekeeping basically I think and and the that you know it could have been made really successful to have loads of bees here but it's not really my thing I've discovered in terms of how much time have you got and and you know so projects you got to be a bit careful I've got to be careful you know not to take on too much and that leads me into sort of the concluding part you know for me it's vegetables and food that's what I want to do mainly grow well why don't I take in that more ground there but it for me also it's about really doing it well keeping on top of it as I've been saying you know you can see very few weeds time efficiency so I feel I've got to the point where I don't want to take in more ground actually the this area here is now 660 square meters of crop space and that's not that's about two-thirds of what was I had already 900 square meters that's a lot of vegetables to manage in this very intensive way you know I'm not just growing potatoes and cabbages and onions one crop a year the kind of thing this is every bed is cropped and recropped and and to maximum potential so I'm hoping that you you've had a look at this you've seen some possibilities ways of turning weeds into beautiful productive fertile ground have a look at the playlist that we've got uh, for new area I should call it I still call it the new area and I still find it slightly crazy to remember what it was like when I began and first stepped out into this very empty, overgrown, weedy field and look what it's become. Mm -hmm.